Um, well, thank you for that. I, I, of course, we, of course, are a Connexa customer. I've got a series of comments, Rudy, but we'll discuss them offline. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, it's great to be here. And what I wanted to do, this is, the theme of this is really about dreams and leadership. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the state of the world, uh, a little bit about leadership, and then take questions on, on anything that you guys would like to talk about. I, I want to start by asking, how long is the future? Anyone know? It's interesting. Uh, I've been looking at this question of how long the future is, because there's all this sort of interesting numbers about our country. The percentage of Americans living below the poverty line reached its highest level in 20 years, 46.2 million, or 15% of the population. We spent 16% of our GDP on healthcare, the second highest proportion in the world. And the federal budget deficit will be another $1.3 you know, trillion. Dollars. You know, trillion here, trillion there, whatever. So how do we end up with these numbers? I think that they're a failure of short-term thinking. And so when I asked you the question, how long is the future, you might have thought, my life, my children's life, my grandchildren's life, what have you. If you ask a politician that, it's four years or two years. It's interesting. If you're a government worker, you ask them that question, it's next week because the government failed to approve the continuing revolution. Their budget expires in a week. Now, and you want them to have long-term thinking? I mean, come on. I mean, let's have a conversation about this. Uh, and, and in companies, most companies, and my suspicion is some of the companies that you all work for, it's really quarter by quarter. So we become is dependent upon institutions that are structured around short-term thinking, in particular through incumbency and through the way they generate incentives, paid to the quarter, re-elected, or what have you. And because this sort of horizon is so short, I think it completely under, undermines the conversations that we want to have. And the problem is that because you have such short time frames, in the short term you have, sh you have simple solutions. But the world's not organized that way. The world is complicated. It's getting more complicated in, in lots and lots of ways. There are two billion people online for the first time. Uh, there, that number is expected within about 10 years to be up to about 5 billion, mostly because of the spread of mobile phones. Um, we have access to information at a scale that's unimaginable. The statistics are that there are 295 exabytes, and exabyte is a very large number, by the way. Um, of data in existence, 315 times more pieces of information than every grain of sand on every beach in the world. Right. Um, 600 new tweets a second, 48 hours of YouTube uploaded every minute, and that number is climbing pretty dramatically. So it seems to me that there's a fundamental contra contradiction in the way that our society is preparing for the future. On the one hand, we have all of this amazing data, and you all are plenty smart. You could think this through. You can have a nice long-term horizon. Um, but we're asking for simple solutions in a very complicated world because our time horizon isn't right. What are we trying to achieve? Now, uh, so to me, ultimately, all of these questions are leadership questions, which I think is, affects all of us. And again, you're talking about in other contexts here in, in the meeting. But you know, systems and, and institutions are not soulless automatons. These are run by, by people, by, by us. And how do we end up with this sort of dysfunction? I think it's a function of, of, of leadership or lack thereof. And I was trying to think about a, a sort of a vehicle to talk about leadership. And tragically, of course, my friend Steve Jobs died last week. And so I thought I'd use him as a metaphor for the difference between normal leadership, which produces these bad outcomes, and extraordinary leadership. And let's use some stories from that example. So, so what's interesting is when most people talk about leadership, like if you read the generic books and the generic articles, they really talk about themselves. You know, this is what I like, this is what I don't like. Uh, or a, a collection of feel-good sound bikes. Oh, you know, written by, you know, the architecture people. You know, sort of, oh yeah, that's beautiful and so forth. Real leadership is something very different. And, you know, in Steve's case, I think he's going to be rem remembered in the category of Edison, Tesla, and Ford. So we're talking about somebody of significant historic role. And he lived a rich and complex life. He accomplished a lot and leaves, you know, leaves sort of this amazing leg legacy. And without a doubt, he was a brilliant leader. 
And over time, academics, pundits, and experts are going to sort of try to figure out what the essence of it. But I want to talk about it a little bit to use it as an example. I learned a bunch of things from Steve, and one is it starts with having a vision. Okay? Now, you hear this all the time. What does it actually mean? He wasn't an engineer, and he wasn't a very good programmer. Um, I, of course, was a very good programmer, so like, what's he useful for? Right? That would be sort of my typical engineering attitude. Um, but he had something that I did not have. He had a vision, and he was driven by something by making computing personal. So I worked at Xerox Park, where a lot of this stuff was invented. And in 1979, Steve visited Xerox Park, and he saw the Xerox Alto, which is the predecessor of the modern PC and Mac. Um, Xerox, of course, had no effective plans to bring this to the market. But Steve went back and said, "I want to build one of those." Now he had to had sort of build a mouse, and the way you built a mouse was you had to have a rolling ball. So he went. To, to Walgreens and bought all of the deodorant cans and took the little balls out of the cans to use that as the basis for the mouse. He saw then, right, he needed a volume platform. In this case, it was deodorant cans. But the point is that if you, if you want to be, if, if you want to be a good leader, you have to leave people somewhere interesting, right? Leadership is not, oh, let's go, you know, do, do tomorrow's meeting. Please show up at three, which is, I think, where people get, get sort of obsessed about. Leadership is about trying to set an agenda for what the future should like in the things that you care about. And in his particular case, ultimately, over the next 30 years, tablets and the iPad in 2010, the Apple stores in 2001, the iMac in 1998, each of which was extraordinarily controversial. In each case, I thought they would be a failure. Shows you how right I am. Uh, because conventional wisdom said they wouldn't work. And I could take you through the reasoning of each one, but it was leadership betting on the right, uh, in the right outcomes and then sweating the details that ultimately made it happen. What's interesting is I was very, very skeptical of all of these things, and yet they were successful. And when you see that, you would have to dial your own humility down, or up, I guess, your arrogance down. You have to say, well, maybe I missed it. Maybe here's an opportunity for me to learn something that I did not know. So if you have to, if you want to understand leadership, you have to lead from the front. You actually have to say, this is what we're going to do. And, and so the crucial issue of leadership is establishing what your beliefs are and staying true to them. And that, by the way, I'm not suggesting that you make blind assumptions about the directions and say, we're going to take the hill, and the hill is there, and we're running, running, and so forth without, without regard to data. What I'm suggesting is that you have a goal. And you have a goal that's an overarching goal, a goal that really matters to people, one that people can get excited about. And then you embrace using all of these new tools that all of us talk about and are, again, talked in much of this conference, data-driven decision-making. So what does that look like? In order to change the world, you have to be able to understand it. I, you know, I love this. You have, I sit there in Washington, and you have these conversations that are completely without any facts. So I carry my little, in my case, a Mac. Right? And I, I asked Google, you know, it's sort of, is that fact true? And inevitably, it's amazing what a fact-based conversation does to a politician. <laughs> Did you know? You know, we, we should begin to judge leadership, and in particular, our political leadership, but our decision makers, your management, yourself, you should be judged by whether you use data and for what ends. And, and, and sort of the, my new, new mantra as a leader, is in God we trust, but everyone else has to bring data. <laughs> it's okay, right? So at Google, we do exactly this sort of approach. We, we do all sorts of wacky things. Uh, my current list of wacky things, self-driving cars, likely to drive you home when you're drunk much better than you. Uh, renewable energy, something which is likely to be a very large industry in the future. And the Lunar X Prize and space technology. So why are we doing that? Because we think there's an opportunity there. Because the data-driven approach says there's a strategy or a plan, and maybe it'll play out. But we're making big bets on the future using data. It's not just some hunch. right? We're not just sitting there saying, oh, you know, this is sort of fun. We'll go play over here, play over there, or what have you. And, and what we've done is we've crunched the numbers, but we're adhering to the vision that we outlined. And to me, that's the point here about leadership. So when I joined Google in 2001, I thought it was an interesting little software company. But I did it fundamentally because my two 
colleagues and, co and founders, Sergey and Larry, had a vision to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Now, how long does that take? Can we do it in a quarter or a year or whatever? Well, we don't know whether it's going to be 50 years or 1,000 years. But the point is it's an example of a goal that you can recruit the very best people to work on because it's sufficiently audacious that we really want to solve this problem. And what's interesting is, you know, man's reach usually exceeds its grasp, but that's okay. That's part of hope and renewal and all of those sorts of things. But if you don't aim high enough, you'll never hit your target. If you want to be a leader, you have to be worth it. You actually have to earn it. And that means you have to take the people to a place that's worth going to. Another, another lesson I learned from Steve was about quality. Don't compromise on it. He cared a lot about quality, and to him it meant two things, beauty of the things that he worked on and consistently striving for perfection. In 2008, he, we're sitting there, and Vic, who works with me, gets a phone call from Steve saying, we have an urgent issue, Vic. And Vic says, yes, Steve. Um, I've been looking at the Google logo on the iPhone, and the second O does not have the right gradient of yellow. We have to get the number right now. It's a crisis. Like, who cares, right? Well, he cared. I learned something from that. And we had to correct it immediately because otherwise it was a huge crisis that our color was not correct. So, so beauty was not, an, in Steve's case, was not a, an afterthought or an indulgence. It was a fundamental part of what he saw as the vision for what he was trying to do, that the aesthetics were as important as the functionality. This is a new concept for engineers who are generally reasonably clueless in this area and certainly applies to me. But the fact of the matter is that this was entirely connected to the vision that he had for computing, which he brought along to the industry of which I've meant. So to me, uh, in thinking about this and putting it into context, I think his obsession with art and beauty helped him to recognize that to recognize people the way they really are. We are not automatons, we are not engineers, we are not, we are human. We have all of these other sensors as well. So if you're gonna do something, do it right. Do it with taste, do it with style, do it in a human way, and do it and fight for it. It's interesting that, and another example with Steve, um, he, he became convinced of something, and he was, so, he was so charismatic in his view that I, who am an expert in object-oriented programming, managed to be convinced by him that I was wrong. We spent an hour talking to him. My team and I stood out in the parking lot trying to deconstruct his argument to prove that he was wrong. He saw us outside and he ran back outside to argue with us some more. <laughs> because he knew he was right and we knew he was wrong. That's what I'm talking about. Most people would have said, oh, you know, I'm not gonna see them again, it doesn't really matter. Not true. But what's interesting is that people who work with people like that very seldom regret working for such people. Now, th this quest for perfection makes us better. And it makes people achieve greater things and makes our legacies worth remembering. And I think the best ideas require a certain amount of conflict. Consensus is the enemy of excellence. So you sit there and you go, oh, how are we gonna run the company? Oh, we'll get to consensus probably produces a mediocre outcome. You want to get to the best idea. You don't, want to, you don't want to have a consensus. If we did a consensus of everybody here and some normal consensus process, it would probably not be very interesting, if I may be offensive. Sorry. Um, but if we asked everybody at each table to suggest the absolute best idea, and then we had a big food fight about which idea was the best one, everybody would have a learning idea, and I bet you an unpredictable table Right, the, the people in the back who never participate would have the best idea. Right? It's usually how it works. But you have to be open to that. You have to be open to the new idea, and then you have to drive to a process that produces the literally best idea. Now, people don't like dissent. Right? If you've been in meetings where you disagreed and something was said and chose not to speak up, you, know, you, might, you, don't, you, you chose not to be stuck because you, you don't want to be marked as disagreeable. You know, oh, I get along, we get along, and so forth and so on. It's a bad idea. But properly managed, dissent produces great outcomes. It makes us challenge our preconceived notions of, and stale thinking, the kinds of things that historical practice or intuition can easily produce. If you want to do something new, you have to break something. Consensus 
and inertia produce the same thing as last year, which is, it's okay if that's your goal, but I don't think that's leadership, but I don't think that's fundamentally the right thing to do in a business. So if you want to be a leader, sometimes you have to be a dissenter, and sometimes you have to tolerate dissent. Don't let people sit silently through meetings. Everyone has something to contribute. Otherwise, why do they work for you? Right? Why, are they just sort of like friendly? You like to look at them sitting there? <laughs> watching them eat? You know, what, my, you see my point? I mean, if they're not of value in the conversation, why are they there? If they are of value in the conversation, then listen to them. And if they don't speak up, get them to say something. Easiest way to get somebody to say something is ask them a question. Shocking. We've done this for years, since we were children. Um, I think the final comment I was going to make about, about lessons from Steve had to do with community. And by community, I hear, I, I mean sort of the ecosystem. The great companies build an ecosystem, a platform. They are not a one product. They're not a one message. They are, in fact, an ecosystem of energy and et cetera. Um, I've recently been talking about four companies which I believe are leading the tech industry, and we can talk about this if you're interested in um, Apple, Google, Facebook, and Amazon, each of which now have built very large scalable platforms of which many, many other companies are dependent. We've never in our industry had four companies uh, at this scale growing at this valuations, this amount of cash, this amount of reach globally. It's a remarkable, remarkable thing. When you think about this ecosystem, how do you achieve these things? Well, part of it is leadership, which we've talked about. But the other one has to do with hiring. You all know a lot about hiring. Uh, you want to have a process that produces literally the best people in your company. So ultimately, less than half of 1% of the applicants that we see at Google ultimately get hired. Why are we so tough? In, in, to some degree, because we want our employees to become leaders as well. We, want, we would rather screen before they come into the company and then develop them as a leader and then try to keep them. And if you think about that and then you think about their ability to operate, if I, using the military as an example, if you're on an aircraft carrier, you're struck by how 23-year-olds are busy launching $100 million extraordinarily dangerous things into the air you know, over and over and over again. There's a leadership model around trust and scalability for young people that produces amazing future leaders. In our case, we've been able to not only do this, but we've also been able to build platforms that people can build on using those leadership skills. Android, for example, which is now by far the most successful mobile platform at all, is an example of such an ecosystem where a completely separate team got excited about it and just ran. And now we're just pouring and pouring more money into what they're doing, as you would imagine, because of its success, as the model takes off. And that's what technology is all about. So, so ultimately, I think all of the best technologies are platforms at some level. And what we're understanding now in technology is that if you can see that platform and using leadership, you can go after it, you can build extraordinarily wealth. So to me, it's, it, leadership is, uh, you t people tend to use their I word a lot. Leadership is about everyone else. It's how you make them feel. It's what you inspire them to do. It's how you articulate this vision of where they should go. So when I would talk about Google, I try to think about it. It's not what people have done within Google. Of course, we're very arrogant as well. Um, but it's about the shopkeepers and manufacturers and the artists and craftsmen, and nonprofits, all the people who are using Google to become leaders in their own right. So it's the empowerment that we created that created the empowerment of us. And that's, I think, the lesson to be learned about these ecosystems. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to sort of finish a little bit and then take questions and comments. I wanted to talk a little bit about leadership in America and a little bit about the future. Um, you know, we're facing all of these grand challenges and everybody watches TV, you see everybody fighting on the television, which is good for television writing but bad for society. Um, there, there are deep structural problems in the way the society is working. We've become dependent upon institutions which are inherently inherently structured to promote short-term thinking. By the way, it's their incentives. This is not that complicated. Think about their incentives. Of course. You're shocked that something happens. Well, the incentives drive this behavior. 
So, so somehow we lack these transformative leaders. Uh, good men and, and women try to challenge the institutions and they fail because the leadership model doesn't, doesn't sort of, whether it's the institutional constraints or other things like that. Can you ever imagine a politician with the insight and vision of Steve Jobs? Very hard to imagine. The incentive system is quite different. Can you imagine government aiming for perfection or beauty in decision making? I want you to think about that thought as you stand in the line for the driver's license, right, or trying to do your taxes. You know, just think about it. So what we need is we need to figure out a way in a society as sort of these new communities of, of innovation and leadership in our countries. We need to, to reduce the roadblocks that exist in the way of entrepreneurship, and we need ways to encourage people to pursue their dreams. There's a whole generation of new people who have come out of our universities. We have the best universities in the world, by the way. 19 of the top, top 20 universities in the world are in the United States. And they are underemployed or unemployed right now. That is a national tragedy. Because every one of them has an opportunity to ultimately sit at tables like what we have, to change the world you know, in the next decade or two as their careers develop and so forth. To me, it starts with reforming the education system in our country so that we can sort of raise a generation of longer-term thinker, thinkers to search for beauty in art, to, to, to sort of think about rigorous academic training, which somehow we don't seem to want to do anymore in science, technology, engineering, and math. Now, I say this as a strive. If fear works as a motivator, sometimes that's better than a goal, let's talk about what Asia is doing. Well, we'll come back to that. The point is that we're no longer alone. So not only do we have to do this because it's the right thing, we also have to do it because other people are also doing things even better than we are in this area. We need to change the way the decision making is done in this country. Can you, you know, we need to improve the systems uh, and, and make decisions based on smart ideas. In the budget crisis, which to me was, was just a disaster from an American perspective, the government decided not to fund the FAA for two weeks. Uh, over a $50 million dispute. Well, because they failed to approve this particular bill, the government did not receive $500 million of taxes from the friendly airline industry. So it was a net negative $450 million. Can you imagine running a business like that? You'd be fired. I mean, you know, it's the stupidest thing you've ever seen. I can go through a long, long list. But my point is that, that I would like to see that the elections that we're having be decided on which candidate can come up with the best program for innovation in our country, for new jobs, new businesses, new economic growth in the way that we're talking about. Why don't we have politicians take innovation pledges? They take pledges for everything else, every other special interest. But innovation is at the core of the American ideal. It's what got me here. It, uh, my guess is it got everyone here. I know in your case, it allowed you to found your company, which is represented here, which you must be very proud of, Rudy. It's the, it's the American dream. So, you know, Steve said, your, your life is limited. Don't waste it living someone else's life. I thought it was very profound. Uh, to me, these are the defining challenges for political leadership in the next, in the next decade. So I'd, I'd like to finish by now having talked about the principles, talk a little bit about what's possible. And just as the generations that I've been part of managed to create all of these amazing things, which to me is like, oh my God, you know, here I am in Orlando and everything works. You know, it's just you, you travel everywhere in the world. The networks work, the products work. It's amazing what you can do. The next, next Google, next Apple, and so forth will be some union around mobile, local, and social. Mobile in the sense of devices that are personal and carried. Local as in the sense of we live in local context. Your friends are here. You know where you are. You buy things locally and so forth. And social, we are very social. Shocking, right? It's amazing. People actually don't like sitting at home by themselves. They want to be connected. This has only been true for about 100,000 years. New fact. So in search, which of course we do, we want to go to the point where we get the answer right. We want to go from giving you a large set of choices, right, sort of a, sort of a gateway, if we will, model, to a model where 
we can actually compute the answer. A simple example of what's the weather in Orlando? Well, we just tell you. There are many, many more sub subtle things that we can do. And you can imagine a world where, as, as, uh, and under Moore's law, remember, Moore's law says that computers are performance is roughly doubling every two years, which turns out to be roughly 30 times in 10 years or roughly 1,000 times in 20 years. So in our lifetimes, computers will be 1,000 times faster or maybe 100,000 times faster or maybe a million times faster, depending on how old you are. That's pretty amazing. Well, in that context, what happens is people continue to do what we're really good at, intuition, entertainment, laughing a lot, getting ourselves in trouble, right? That's sort of what humans are good at. Computers are very, very good at remembering everything very precisely and doing analytics on all that data. So you can imagine a symbiosis over the next decade, if you will, where the mobile devices do the stuff that we're no good at, remembering everything. And we are ultimately freed, if you go back to the original vision that I was talking about with Steve, that we're freed to be more human as opposed to being enslaved by these devices. So sometimes it feels that way. So you can literally know everything. An interesting statistic is that in the year 2020, they'll have the equivalent of, of iPods, small hard drives. They have 640 years of HD video on them. So you give this to your baby at birth, and he or she cannot watch all the video in their natural life. I mean, that's how astounding the data revolution really is. And you can imagine, and that's assuming that we don't add any video <laughs> during the, next, the child's 85 years of life. Um, you're never lonely. There's always someone to talk to. You're never bored. There's always something to do. You, you literally can learn everything. You can watch everything. You can speak every language. All of those are possible. Um, what about a product built in this technology Let's imagine, um, let's think about Amazon. Amazon just brought out a, a new, ta essentially a tablet competitor. Imagine a, a future version of that at $100 that has children's books that are translated into 100 languages, which are then circulated around the world to improve childhood reading in the third world, which is one of the, the key determinants of, of outcome. All of these things are possible because of the union of mobile local social, Moore's Law, universal translation, and universal access to information. We're going to be, um, the situation with the human genome, about 10 people's full genomes have been sequenced. And the cost of that is, is quite high. In the next decade, it'll be possible to do one hour sequencing of your genome. So in theory, you'll walk into the hospital, they'll sequence your genome, and then tell you all sorts of things you probably didn't want to know. Another, another good disincentive to not go to the hospital. Uh, the revolution that that implies for healthcare and preventative uh, drugs and preventative issues that we all face as, as genetic animals um, is, is unbelievable. Think about traveling. Everybody here, all of you travel a tremendous amount. The airline system is probably not going to be much better in the next decade, I suspect. Um, but one thing that will happen is we'll have full 3D holographic video conferencing. So you'll sort of be able to almost touch them or hit them, depending on how mad you are, um, in the holographic image that we can produce with this new generation of technology. The link here is that the technology world and the information world is moving so fast with such capabilities that in my view, if we took the long view, if we took a view of a decade or two decades and we said, where do we want to be in 10 years or 20 years as a society? What are the aspects that, are, that it's going to look like? We have such an incredibly promising future. And the technology world is bringing this to us. It's, a, uh, it's just, in my view, the beginning of making our lives much more interesting, much more safe, and much more fun. This is why I do what I, I do. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about this. And I'm happy to answer your questions. So thank you. Let's see. Do we, uh, uh, Andrew has a question. Let, let's see if we can, do we have some, we have some mics in the back? Uh, why don't you just yell and I'll repeat it. Oh, you have a, yes, you, yes, you do have a mic. You have the other mic.
uh, I understand you have a book coming out. Would you be willing to share with us a little bit about its premise? And, and oh, thank you. Um, the <laughs> so my colleague Jared Cohen and I have been working on a book on foreign policy. We wrote an article in Foreign Affairs about the future of mobile computing and governments. And, and it spawned, spawned this book. And it goes something like this. We're reasonably convinced that governments are not prepared for what's about to happen. And I'm not as focused on China and the US. China, because China is smart enough and controlling enough and mean enough to sort of suppress it. And the Western world, the United States and Europe, are democratic enough and open enough to allow it to occur and deal with the consequences. We're talking about the other 200 countries. Um, which are characterized by dynamic society and relatively weak government. So when you have a dynamic society, those people have a lot of opinions and, and they're, they're strong-willed, and you connect them, all sorts of stuff happens. And I'd like to tell you, by the way, that it augurs in democracy, that it somehow allows you know, the Constitution to be written and the Bill of Rights and so forth, but it could go either way. Uh, the empowerment of mobile devices could allow a religious majority to further oppress a religious minority in these countries. So we worry about that. Um, we worry a, a lot in, in our thinking about the question of terrorism and dissent. And it goes something like this. Um, in this connected world, if you're in a, 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 an autocratic state, a police state, you would build tools that would use encryption to have private communication between us. So you and I would do that, and we would use that to evade the authorities. Those are the, exactly the same tools that a terrorist in America would use, unfortunately, to do something very evil, which you and I wouldn't do, which tells you that the tools will be available. So how do we detect them? How do we stop them? How do we monitor them? So these are some of the things that we're thinking about. Our, our general view is that there's a new force coming into society, which is consumerism. And traditional foreign policy says that it's about state actors, you know, state A and state B, and they're all fighting each other. So for example, uh, when consumerism happens, the states are no longer just the country. It's also the diaspora of all the people outside of that country who are friends with people in that country, you know, the expatriates and so forth. Another thing we spent quite a bit of time looking at is cyber terrorism. And we're reasonably convinced that countries will be at peace, but at war in cyberspace. And that that will be accelerating, because the stakes are too high. So these are the kind of things we're talking about. Publication in June. Thank you. Let's see, more, let's see, questions? Yes, we'll wait for a few. OK, go ahead. The question had to do with, uh, so you can hear it, is uh, we, uh, Steve and I disagreed on things. Uh, so how can, one, how can both be successful? And I think in, first you learn from disagreement. Right? So uh, Steve, for example, and I spent a lot of time talking about our, his, our, our respective roles in the ecosystem. And his position was that as long as he was in charge of the UI and I was in charge of the back end, everything was fine. <laughs> so that shows you Sort of his, that, that's in, in Steve talk, that's a compliment to, to, to me about the engineering. And that's obviously a view which I share about their ability, their ability to do it. Now, we ultimately did not fully agree, which is why they threw me off the board. Um, but, but it's an example where you can learn from that conflict. I also think that, that um, there are multiple leadership styles. And the leadership style should be appropriate for where you are in the ecosystem. So if you're, a, if you're an engine room supplier, right, the kinds of people, the kinds of marketing and so forth is going to be quite different than if you're a fashion designer. Right? The style, the way you brand yourself and so forth, and there's nothing wrong with that. Both are important. So I think that's, so it's important, I think, in that sense to play your position. Because so there's, there's more than one way. But what I will tell you is that the unifying principle is take a position of where you're going to be. In, in Google's case, we took a position uh, which people have forgotten, that for 
for the last eight to 10 years, we've spent more on capital than the sum of all of the other software companies combined. And we were routinely criticized by the analysts who, who generally did not understand why we were doing. And we said, look, you know, we want these huge data centers because we have stuff we're putting in them. And they say, well, you know, you're overspending on capital. I said, how do you know? What do you know about what's in our data center? It's a secret. How can you possibly criticize us? You don't have any facts, right? So we would have fun with them. Uh, and ultimately that overspending, if you will, in the data center case has allowed us to build YouTube uh, because the amount of video and, and so forth, you, you literally have to spend billions of dollars on computers in specialized places and so forth, specialized networks to make it happen. So that's a, if you will, it's a competitive barrier to entry, right, against our other video competitors because we, we had more capital. So that's an example of, of a leadership position. So as a result, the very best data center people all came to work for us. So we got, a, we got our unfair share, if you will, of the best talent. So when you state your goal, if you state it right, then you should be able to attract the really best talent as a result. And the rest is history. And hopefully you'll manage them well. Let's see, some more questions. Yes, ma'am. So the question was, what, what are the best lessons to folks here? I think the first, the, the first is, uh, it's a set of things. Um, you have to have a pretty clear idea of what you're trying to accomplish. If you're sort of confused, be honest and say, I'm in a sort of a wandering period. Going back to Steve, um, he spent a couple of years working on a company called Next after he'd been kicked out of Apple the first time. Now. People have been very critical of that period. To me, that was the most important period because it allowed him to rethink it, right? Gave him some time to repot himself, if you will. So I think the first is leadership is what am I doing? Why, why is my idea important? Can I get other people excited about it? If you care about education, a lot of people do that. What's your proposal for fixing education? If you care about your customers, what are they doing and how do you solve the problem in a particularly good way? I think that's the start. The second thing has to do with discipline. Um, the, uh, so I'm a pilot, we're flying into Midway, um, the weather's really bad, you all are the passengers, and I get on the, on the, um, on the PA and I said, now the weather's really bad and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try hard to land, okay? <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is not the right answer. Uh, how about, um, the weather's really is tough, it's down to minimums, uh, there's icing been reported, and I've done this in the simulator, and it's, although it's my first time, I know what to do, okay? <laughs> Not the correct answer. Okay, the correct answer is, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get this plane on the ground. And I think at some level, you have to combine the vision and the whatever it takes. And that translates to commitment. And, and, and the, um, various of my coaches over the years have said, you know, you're not a good enough actor, Eric, to make this stuff up. You know, people will see through it. If you're not committed, just be honest. If you're committed, then commit yourself. Learn the details, take the time, be involved with the details and so forth, and really get on it. And, and I would say that most of the leadership discussions I've been in don't say that. What they say is, um, oh, you should understand it and you should work hard and have balance in your life. None of that's possible. Great leadership is, I'm committed. We're gonna land this airplane and we're gonna do it right and we're going together and we're going to all survive, or whatever more positive example you'd like. <laughs> yes, sir. So you mentioned you, there's four companies that lead technology, Google, Facebook, Apple, and Amazon. All of those are not really business software. They don't sell to enterprises at all. Do you think there'll be a leader in technology that sells to large companies that kind of dominates that space? Um, well, many people would say that it's Microsoft. And as a historic competitor to Microsoft, I would never say nice things about Microsoft. It would be out of character. Uh, <laughs> that one has to be true to one's brand. Uh, so I, a rough reading of the business software industry is that um, Microsoft and Oracle have largely, uh, have largely sort of established this sort of relatively inflexible architecture and what happened was the consumer model 
was built out of that and then eventually exploded into this open model involving the web and so forth, which has grown the rest of it. Um, and so it's now an opportunity to go back into the business software model and build these sort of open architectures. Uh, I should be clear that Oracle is busy suing us and we have a competitor in this space, so I'm not, a, I'm not an unbiased observer. Um, give you an example. I have pretty much stopped using Microsoft Word because I use Google Docs. And if you haven't used Google Docs, it's okay. It's probably legal in your company. And it's free. And, it's, and so Jared and I are writing a whole book on Google Docs. So what happens, is we, what happens is we sit there, we're sitting at breakfast, and he's you know, sitting next to me, and we're typing on the same document you know, word by word and moving the cursor and so forth. It's the sharing model in this web, in this web stuff is amazing. So the next place for a business software company and for an innovator and so forth is somebody who can break through the current relatively monolithic architectures which derive from XML and all the other things that were invented 10, 20 years ago and build these highly collaborative workspaces that work for companies that give them data analytics, um, all the things that they need, all the special security stuff that they need, um, collaboration and so forth within the company's purview and under the, in, within the firewall and all of that. There are such companies, they're quite small, but they do exist. And my guess is the, one of them will become the next Microsoft and Oracle. And, and I'm quite convinced that the existing incumbents won't make it because they never make it such a fundamental architectural transition. They have too much at stake with the existing architectures. More questions? Yeah, there's one right here. You were talking about innovation the importance of that, and obviously your company's a leader there. What, what are the most successful programs or initiatives you've put in place at Google to really drive innovation at your company? Um, it starts with hiring. And, um, you know, a reputation for innovation, sort of tolerating the unusual nature of the people that you're hiring. They're often, often unusual characters, uh, et cetera. Um, the, the systemic things that we've done are, are a couple. One is that we have something called 20% time, which says that an engineer can spend 20% of their time working on whatever they want. And before you get too worried about it, remember that these are engineers. They're not that exciting. You know, they're not going to go off and you know, do something completely unrelated. And virtually all of, the, all of the innovation at Google has started as a 20% time idea. You know, so and so thought, well, this is interesting. Maybe I could do this and so forth. But the other aspect about 20% time that I did not fully understand was it serves as an escape valve on bad management. So if I'm the engineer and you're the manager and you're giving me a hard time because I'm late or whatever, I can look you straight in the eye and I can say, I'm going to give you 100% of my 80% time. You've got 100% of my 80% time. You've got an absolute commitment. I'm going to work really hard for 80% of the time. And again, because these are engineers, they don't have any personal lives, right? So they basically work all the time anyway. So it's, it works out, <laughs> right? It's not a problem. And you all should try this. Um, but, but culturally, it, it changed the model of command and control. And command and control is death for innovation uh, in most companies because the, the middle management becomes very consensus driven and doesn't really produce exceptional things. You need stuff that's bottoms up or tops down. Uh, in the Steve case, Steve would just mandate it. And he was the founder and brilliant and arrogant enough to pull it off. At Google, what happens is it's a, it's a dance between the two founders and the uh, young engineers, typically, who deal directly with Larry and Sergey, and they sort of plot this stuff. So sometimes it's top down, sometimes it's bottom up. But it's very important it not be completely predictable. Uh, I grew up in the mini computer industry, um, you know, DEC and Sun and those sorts of places. And they were very, very, very hierarchical. And we had two, three, four year product plans. When I showed up at Google, we didn't have any product plans at all. I said, like, when's your next deliverable? I said, oh, next week. It's a different way of running things. And it works. So it doesn't bother me that there isn't a plan for 2013. I mean, we'll get to 2013 eventually. What I do know is that we've got the right incentives around long-term shareholders. In our case, in our case it's stock-related. Um, we have a vision. We have a lot of smart people working on it. And, we, and I know that they're working hard. And that's all I need. I don't need to track it beyond that. The lady in the back, go ahead. Yes, yes, ma'am. 
Okay, so on the note of culture, Google has grown uh, a little bit in the past two years, from, from what I understand. Um, and you also have a pretty specific culture. So can you talk a little bit about how you how you've managed your culture over the years to kind of keep what makes you Google, despite um, a pretty huge uh, and, and rapidly grown workforce? I think the culture is determined by the people, not the management. You know, in other words, the the, cult, the first culture decision is the person that you're hiring. Um, and my guess is that if the senior leadership changed, which it won't, but if it were to, the culture would remain pretty similar. Um, you know, for decades, and I suspect that will be true in the other companies that we've that we've cited. So cultures once set are difficult to change. Um, so as you grow, uh, you know, the, the, the canonical question is, how do you maintain the small company culture in a fast growing big company? And the answer is, you can't. What you do is you have to replace it with something else, something about a local context or local, local this. So uh, an example would be that if you travel to different Google offices, they all feel slightly different and they all have a local flavor to them. So they feel googly is the term that we use but they're slightly different from California where it was all built. And, and that's, I think, a good thing. So a certain amount of tolerance for a de deviation from the norm is helpful. When I see these highly, highly, highly regimented cultures that you see as you wander around the world, uh, I worry that they guarantee that there will never be any innovation because anyone who's innovative will look at that sort of incumbency of culture and they won't be willing to change a thing. Uh, and I'm struck by, uh, when I talk to people, uh, when I talk to people in government and universities and in large companies, they always nod their head like this about innovation and they do exactly nothing. So to me, I, I've now learned to say, what will you do as a result of this conversation? And they typically don't know. If they give a speech, one of the, the other observation I would make is that knowledge is not the same thing as action. And we're in a situation as a society where we're going to know everything bad. But it used to be that knowledge was somehow a catalyst for action. Uh, but if you look at climate change, something which I've been pretty heavily involved with, the fact that we know we have a climate change problem has not materially changed what the politics in America are doing about it because the incentives and incumbencies are too strong. Now that's a political question which we can debate, but the point is that knowledge was not the, re not the sole problem that you had. Um, and I have a, a friend uh, named Mike Slaby who explained to me that, that as usual I was wrong because my, my model of every, all that information and online would change the world is not sufficient. And his view is you need that and you need a field organization to go affect real change. And I think he's right. right. A history with losing employees for poaching, but you also have a pretty remarkable history of them finding their way back to your organization. <laughs> uh, talk about that a little bit and what your view and your outlook is in terms of uh, re recruiting, retaining, and recapturing talent as you need it. And what's the value of Google? Well, I've always thought that the best CFO was one who went bankrupt in their last job. Because that's a guy who understands what it's like to go bankrupt, and they're not going to do that again, right? <laughs> so I think there's a fair amount of benefit to sort of sampling as an adult, especially if you have young people who've only worked in one company. There's a fair amount of benefit for them having seen a little bit of the rest of the world and realizing who they are. Um, in my case, I was at Sun, which was a good home for me. I went to Novell culturally very different from what I was used to. And eventually, I, I realized it wasn't my culture. It's not, how, um, it's not how I work. It's, it's your fine people, by the way. It's just not my culture. But I had to go there to learn it. Intele it's different from knowing it intellectually and knowing it viscerally. And so, so the, the back and forth, which I think is a, uh, is a pretty good thing in the Valley, um, is probably positive. One of the, uh, to, take a, to take an unfair jab at Microsoft, but it's what I like to do, uh, if you think about Microsoft's dominance in the 90s, it was a one company town. Whereas the similar dominance in the Bay Area was a multi company town. And so the, the, the crossbreeding, inbreeding, motion, and so forth, at least in a genetic sense, would pr produce a better life form. You know, we, we would produce 
more disease resilience.